This program is brought to you by Emory University. So it is a uh, distinct honor and uh, and pleasure to uh, to be able to uh, to welcome you to what uh, is the second annual, but I know will be on the second of many, many years of wonderful gatherings to recall and commemorate the life of a dear friend uh, of all, all of us here at Emory, a dear colleague um, and, uh, and a member of our family, really, the Emory family, David J. Biederman. David was a longtime member of the faculty here at Emory who we lost just over a year ago. Um, he actually gave the inaugural David J. Biederman lecture, uh, so we were lucky to have him here for that and our uh, of course, honored and pleased to have Ambassador Rapp here to give the lecture today. You have a bio about uh, David in your program, uh, and so uh, so I just want to share a few brief reflections of my own about him uh, before then introducing, introducing the ambassador and then uh, welcoming his remarks. Um, so so I had the the really honor of having David as my colleague for ten years here on the faculty. Um, during that time, I came to know him as a colleague, um, as a scholar, and as a family man, for lack of a better word, as a son, as a wife, and as a father um, to, his, to his beloved family. Um, as a colleague, he was beyond compare. Uh, D David really went above and beyond in a, in a place that was already a collegial one. David went well above and beyond the, uh, the call of duty. He would pass by my office um, at least twice a day, coming and going, sometimes over the course of the day, four, five, six, seven times. And I would say most of those times, he would stick his head in and say, how's it going? The, uh, what are you working on? How are things coming along? He would, of course, remember that the day before, I had said that I had hoped that night to complete something, and he would check on me the next morning to see if I had, in fact, completed my task. Uh, and so, so he really sort of, the standard of excellence that he helped instill in me um, as a colleague is one that I will carry with me, I, I, I expect, for the, the entirety of my academic uh, career and my life. Um, as a scholar, it's really hard to know where to begin. In the program it describes, and I would, I would highlight again, his record of productivity over the course of his career, he published 12 books, 125 articles, and more than, gave more than 80 public lectures. This alone would be you know, enough to, to sort of put most of us other academics to shame, um, it, it's even perhaps in a way more telling that during the final years of his life when he is debilitated, you know, he's fighting this debilitating illness of cancer that he was diagnosed with, his productivity only increased. The, so at a time when many of us would feel like we had a good excuse to say, you know what, I've done twice as much as the average human, I can just stop here, David went on to sort of hit it higher and higher marks, hitting four times, 10 times, and 20 times, that of, uh, that of the rest of us. Um, uh, it was from this productivity and this engagement that I took the first lesson really uh, um, about the lesson from David as a scholar, and that was that scholarship not only is a discipline, but also requires discipline. And David really sort of exhibited that in a way that I can only hope that I will use as my pole star for the entirety of my career in terms of the discipline that he brought to his scholarly work. The other strand uh, that I take from his scholarship was, it was the interdisciplinary character of his work. David was really as much a historian and uh, political scientist as he was a, a lawyer, and that brought to his work tremendous insight um, and tremendous value that not all scholarship generates, that not all scholarship produces, but that we all should aspire to. And so that was another characteristic of his scholarship that I, I think is worth noting. Uh, finally, again, over the 10 years that I had the, the, the good fortune of being David's colleague, I had the opportunity to see him again as devoted son, uh, as loving husband, and as wonderful father. Um, too often we think of the demands of our professional, our family life as being, you know, opposed to one another, that you have to choose. You can either be a good father or a good professor. You can either be a good scholar or a good, hus or a good father or husband um, or, or wife. Um, and Dave, David really, I think, in his life, put the lie to that juxtaposition. He was, he was incredible as a scholar, but he was no less incredible as a father. He was incredible as a teacher, uh, but he was no less incredible as a son 
and as a and as a husband. And we're honored today to have here his parents and his beloved wife Lori uh, to help us uh, to help us recall him on this this happy occasion. In the sense that this is exactly what David would have wanted us, the way he would have wanted us to remember him with a gathering to engage ideas and to to sort of elevate our thoughts and to learn new things. He would have thus been um, excited, especially I would say about. The topic of today's uh, today's symposium, uh, as well as today's lecture, writing not long before his death, he wrote that the ICC, the International Criminal Court, has properly been regarded as the last element in establishing a rule of law for individual responsibility in international affairs. This lofty vision of the International Criminal Court of International Criminal Justice generally is what we have been discussing today and will continue to discuss through the day. David would have been no less pleased about the selection of Ambassador Stephen Rapp as the, uh, the presenter of this second annual David J. Biederman lecture. Uh, ambassador Rapp is the ambassador at large at the Department of State heading the Office of Global Criminal Justice. He's been in that position since 2009. Prior to that, he served a number of important positions in international criminal law as well as in, in, on the domestic side. As to the former, he was the prosecutor uh, of the Special Court for Sierra Leone. Um, he led a number of important prosecutions in that capacity, including that of former Liberian President Charles Taylor, uh, in which he won, uh, or during that tenure, he also brought the first convictions in history for the recruitment and use of child soldiers and for sexual slavery and forced marriage. Prior to that, in turn, he was the senior trial attorney and chief of prosecutions for the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, where again, he, he broke new ground in international criminal law, bringing the first convictions in history for leaders of the mass media for the crime of direct and public incitement to commit genocide. And you'll all remember the horrifying facts that, uh, that surrounded that in Rwanda. He served as U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Iowa for, for many years before, after, after serving in private practice and working on Capitol Hill for the U.S. Senate and was even an elected member of the Iowa legislature before that. So he really, he brings to this sort of a broad breadth of experience and particular expertise in, um, in the topic that we're discussing today. And so please join me in welcoming Ambassador Stephen Rapp. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Adier. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here at, at, at Emory. And it's an honor to be here uh, presenting a lecture that commemorates uh, the work of, uh, of David Biederman, who was a leader in this area of, of international uh, legal studies. Uh, last night when I flew in after a busy day in Washington, I was picked up at the airport by, by Courtney Jinn, uh, and, uh, and she asked me when was the last time I was at Emory. Uh, and I said, well, it was as a freshman when I was here on a spring debate tour. Where, at Harvard, we would go out in the spring and during spring break and, and have public debates on, on off topics at, at various colleges and universities around the country. And then at peril of dating myself, I said uh, that was, I think, two days uh, before the assassination of Martin Luther King. Uh, reflecting on the 45 years uh, uh, between uh, then and now, uh, one can see the change that it's possible to, to experience uh, in a lifetime. Uh, from the tragedy of that week uh, to now uh, seeing the re-election to a second term of Barack Obama as, as President of the United States, and from a personal point of view, uh, having an opportunity uh, to serve in, in his administration. But uh, we also reflect that there have been changes in other areas, and, and they've come uh, even faster. And uh, this morning, uh, with the opening speech by Julian, one of your own uh, uh, alumni, um, he spoke of the work of the, of the ICTY, um, which was set in motion uh, not, not 20 years ago, and really began this modern project of international uh, criminal justice. And in the course of it, uh, we've seen uh, enormous change, uh, both in the, in the expectations of, of victims uh, around this world and in the availability of, of, of courts and, and systems of law that permit the most serious crimes known to humankind uh, to be brought and, and judged in a, in, a, in a court of law. Um, he spoke of, of, of that ICTY, the first part of that project, 
And I know my topic today is, is the ICC, uh, but I see this as part of one single uh, global project uh, to establish justice for mass atrocities. Um, ICTY has had, I think, a, a, a sterling a legacy, far exceeding the expectations of, of those that, that established it by Security Council resolution not 20 years ago. We've seen, as he noted, 161 indictments uh, uh, issued and arrest warrants, and not, in the end, a single one unanswered. Uh, the use of, of diplomatic and economic uh, power and, and conditionality and, uh, and all that, that goes with it to actually achieving uh, something that I couldn't achieve when I was the United States Attorney in the Northern District of Iowa. I never remember charging a, that many people over the course of years and, and bringing them all to, to justice. And, and we saw as well, obviously, the, the uh, uh, others like Mladic and Karadzic uh, brought to justice and, and the proficiency uh, that this institution has gradually built in, in trying extremely uh, complex cases. Now with Karadzic uh, uh, in the defense phase, Mladic, uh, which the judges have limited uh, the presentation, I think, to the prosecution to only 200 hours uh, in the interest of, 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 you know, it's selective, but it assures a, a process that, uh, that can, can be completed within a, within a reasonable time period. And, and most importantly, the effect of the ICTY in the region. I spend a lot of time in Bosnia and, and Serbia and Croatia, and obviously what's happening there is imperfect, but you have cases where in Serbian courts, Serbs are being tried for, for crimes against others. Uh, and the same in Croatia and Bosnia. Uh, historic things that would not have occurred but for uh, the ICTY and, and the process that it developed to, to transfer not just uh, indictments but also files and investigations back to the region. <clears throat> You've heard of my own involvement uh, at the ICTR, uh, an institution that hasn't had quite the, the global visibility of the, of the uh, Yugoslavia court. Uh, but it's a court that's, that brought uh, 13 military leaders to justice, including the chief of the general staff and the, and the, and the military strongman of the, of the genocide, 12 government ministers, including the prime minister, seven governors, uh, uh, the leaders of media, the leaders of, uh, of business, uh, even clergy leaders, uh, a total of 83 people arrested in 26 different countries around the world to which they fled and, and brought to uh, uh, to Arusha uh, for, for historic justice, where the first convictions in the history of the world were, were rendered uh, for genocide, including the conviction of a, of a prime minister, John Kambanda, who had uh, served in that role in the interim government for 100 days during the murder of 800,000 people. And then the Sierra Leone court, which I was proud to serve as, as, as chief prosecutor, uh, with a more limited mandate, but with trials, except for the Charles Taylor case, in country, uh, with a mixed constitution, with, with international and national judges working together, with 60% of the employees of the court uh, being from the country, and with an, an amazing alliance with civil society and local communities through an outreach program that was probably the greatest success of the court, that in a country without television, uh, in, well, without television that more than 1% of the people can see, without newspapers that circulate more than 500 issues, Recent uh, uh, survey research uh, has found that uh, you know 95 percent of the people in the country know what the special court has has done, and almost all of them view it as as, as a force for for peace and stability, and, and and reconciliation. And finally, for all of these courts put together, and and this is something that that I'm passionate about as my my former boss, uh, uh, the the. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and my current boss John Kerry is passionate about, and that is justice for the crimes uh, against women, uh, the, the mass incidents of rape and, and gender violence that have been with us in armed conflict from, from time out of mind. But in these institutions, in real cases, with victims with the courage to testify, with evidence that tied uh, uh, perpetrators and leaders uh, to those crimes, we're able to, to obtain it, uh, it uh, in the Arusha Tribunal, the first uh, conviction for the crime of, uh, of, of rape is a crime against humanity, a recognition that rape itself uh, could be a means by which genocide was accomplished even in the absence 
of, of, of a killing. Uh, the, the, the incredibly important decisions by the, and judgments by the, uh, by the ICTY in the area of rape of women in prison camps led off by the FOSHA case in, in, in 2001, and in our Sierra Leone case cases where not only did we have the convictions of rape as a crime against humanity and a war crime, but we also had them for sexual slavery as a crime against humanity and as a war crime. And then uh, in an act of legal creativity which fit the statute and fit the, the expectations of international law, we obtained convictions of forced marriage as, a, as an inhumane act uh, as, as a crime against uh, humanity, convictions which were upheld uh, uh, by our court in our appeals chamber. The, all of this has created, as I said earlier, the expectation uh, around the world that, that justice is possible um, for crimes that are happening today, even for crimes that may have happened uh, 40 years ago. And in my role as, as ambassador at large, I travel about 220 days a year to now, I think, 75 different countries, sometimes mostly uh, to countries that have experienced these crimes, often to other states where we're trying to get their cooperation in, in achieving justice. But everywhere you go, people are saying, you know, if a Milosevic was brought to trial, if a, if a Charles Taylor was convicted, uh, why, uh, uh, you know, why can't, it, uh, uh, why can't it happen here? And of course, for all of us that have been involved and have, have given our, uh, and have worked harder at this than, than anything that we've ever done in our lives, uh, the, the expectation, of course, uh, for this project uh, is, is more than, than justice in a case in Rwanda, more than a conviction of a Charles Taylor, important as it may be, more than, uh, than holding media leaders responsible for incitement uh, for what they did in Rwanda over the course of a year. Uh, what we want is the possibility of justice everywhere and a message sent loud and clear that if you commit these crimes, there is the very real possibility of justice. An essential part of that has to be a permanent international court, a, a court of last resort. Of course, I, as the earlier speaker mentioned, the preference always should be at the national level. The preference always should be as close as possible to the victims, as close as possible to the affected communities. But what when there is no will? What when there is no capacity? We may be able to, to deal with the, with the latter. Uh, it, it's challenging to deal with the former uh, without at least having the possibility that the case could be taken away at, at, at the international level. Of course, we've seen the establishment of, of an international criminal court uh, uh, with a statute written in, in, in Rome uh, ratified and exceeding expectations in, in four and a half years by 60 countries within the next decade. Uh, uh, that number doubled to, to now uh, 121. But of course, we in the United States are, are not a party to that, uh, to that Rome statute, as is, as is the case with Russia and China and Israel and Pakistan and India and, and a number of other uh, countries uh, around the world. And, and so, it's, it's not yet a, a, a court of, of, of last resort. People then ask, you know, the United States, uh, uh, where are we? Uh, where should we be? Where, where can we be? Uh, there is, as we all know, uh, in our constitutional system, the requirement of a two-thirds vote to, in, uh, to ratify a treaty. And, and we know the traditional reluctance of our Senate to, to ratify treaties in the areas of, of public uh, international law. Remembering Wilson going to, to Paris 95 years ago and convincing the rest of the world to, to, to adopt his idea of a League of Nations and coming home and, and, and being unsuccessful and getting it through the Senate. Uh, Forty years uh, that it took to get the Genocide Convention ratified by, by the U.S. Senate and the sort of circumstances that finally made that possible. And then you have, uh, uh, like the Disabilities Convention, uh, which was before the Senate uh, um, in the post-election uh, post session, and there was great hope that it would be ratified because it didn't provide any more restrictions on American employers and business than were already there, but would have demonstrated our leadership in the area of disabilities and the 
protection of people with disabilities across the globe. And uh, in the end, uh, even with Bob Dole, the former Republican leader of the Senate, a disabled veteran, coming to the floor himself to plead with his former colleagues, it was impossible to get, at least in this last session, the two-thirds vote uh, to ratify that treaty, though that is something upon which we have not uh, given up, and, and we hope that the, this, this Senate uh, will, will reconsider uh, that issue. We know also the role that we've been called upon to play uh, in this world, uh, described by former Secretary Madeleine Albright as, as the indispensable nation, the country that people call to when they're threatened uh, by, by terror and, and atrocity, and how ha that has us uh, spread around the world with three million men and, and, and women uh, under arms, potentially sacrificing their all, uh, even their lives, uh, in the interest of, of others. And, uh, and the importance of making sure that they're not unfairly treated uh, as, as, as they go about the, the duties of, of, of protection. So where does that leave us? Well, we saw what happened uh, uh, during the first term of President George W. Bush, the, the active hostility uh, to the court, uh, the passage of a law in 2001 by Congress uh, that prohibited any kind of funding of the United, by the United States, uh, by the United States government of the ICC, the passage in 2002 by 80% majorities in, in both House and Senate of the American Service Members Protection Act, restricting um, uh, our ability to, to assist the court and respond to its requests, but with some important exceptions, which, which I'll discuss later. I saw the declaration by, by former Under Secretary of State uh, uh, John Bolton, that the United States was prepared to act uh, contrary uh, to the, um, the purposes uh, um, of, the, of, of the International uh, Criminal Court. But then, beginning in 2005, we began to see a shift uh, that recognized uh, the fact that the American people very much want to have accountability for mass atrocities. Uh, when they see people suffering, as they did in the former Yugoslavia, when they see a genocide in Rwanda with 800,000 dead, when they see mass mutilation and rape and murder in, in, in Sierra Leone, uh, they responded in, in those situations. And now when, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in 2005, when they saw what was happening in Darfur with genocidal violence against, uh, against, against African, Muslim Africans who of, of, of three ethnicities that were being uh, put into situations where the conditions of life uh, made it impossible for, for them to survive. The uh, uh, American people wanted justice, and, and there was the Statute of Rome. There was the provision that said that the Security Council could, acting in the same way uh, under Chapter 7 that it, it had acted to establish the Yugoslavian Rwanda Tribunal, could send a case to this, to this ICC. And, and the U.S. government made the decision in 2005 not to oppose that, and by 2008 became one of the strongest supporters of, of that referral and of justice uh, uh, in, the, in the situation of, of, of Darfur. Uh, there had been in the American Service Members Protection Act a, a provision that required the United States to negotiate non-surrender agreements with states uh, so that states uh, wouldn't transfer Americans uh, to the uh, uh, to the ICC at peril of having their military assistance and their security relationship with the United States terminated, with the exception of, of NATO countries and a few non-NATO allies. It, it applied to friendly countries like New Zealand or others uh, uh, that uh, faced that prospect if they didn't sign uh, those agreements. Uh, by 2007, uh, Secretary uh, Rice recognized that we were shooting ourselves in the foot, that we were limiting our ability to form global coalitions, and the Bush administration asked for the repeal of that provision of our law and, and the effort to negotiate those, those agreements uh, uh, ended. But in this administration, we've taken this further. Consistent with what President Obama has said about uh, accountability for these crimes being a core national security interest of the United States as well as a moral responsibility. And so we've engaged with the ICC, taking up the role that we were entitled to as participants of Rome, as an observer uh, in the Assembly of States parties, where we could rise and speak uh, after others had spoken, 
and where we could negotiate and engage and, and work with others. And uh, in, in November of 2009, I was proud to lead and co-lead the U.S. delegation uh, into the ICC ASP, the first time we participated in that institution, though, though other non-parties like Russia and China had been there all along. Uh, and since then, to participate in those sessions, uh, to engage in the debates, to, uh, to go to Kampala to the review conference and, the, and participate in the important work that was done there. And in our interventions and in our speech, state our policy. Uh, and in side events as well, I mean, extremely active in these events, uh, which is that we want the, the ICC to succeed. We have looked at our law, looked at that American Service Members Protection Act, which presciently by, by Senator Dodd, who uh, is no longer a senator, uh, but uh, uh, put an amendment uh, forward that was in, in the end unanimously adopted, uh, recognizing his own legacy as, as the son of, of Tom Dodd, who had been really the chief and most effective deputy to Robert Jackson at Nuremberg, uh, this amendment says the United, nothing herein shall prevent the United States from assisting in cases involving individuals, individual non-citizens, who are charged with the genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Now read together with the prohibition on uh, direct funding, legal interpretation has been that that permits the United States on a case-by-case -case basis to assist the ICC uh, in, uh, in, in its prosecutions and, uh, uh, and in, the, in, in achieving justice uh, uh, in, its, in, its, in its trials. And so we've been responding to requests from the prosecutor, from the registrar, and, and, and helping the court. Probably the most important thing that can be done by any state when it comes to international justice, and we saw this with the ICTY, where uh, it wasn't enough to pass a resolution through the Security Council with even Chapter 7 powers that were binding on every state in the world. States could still thumb their nose at it. The prospect of really tough and effective sanctions is, is you know, it wasn't really there. Uh, it took diplomatic and political pressure to bring those, those Milosevic's where we, in the case of Milosevic, uh, uh, said that we couldn't participate in, in, in assistance to, to the rebuilding of the former Yugoslavia unless he was sent. Uh, we later conditioned uh, uh, explicitly our aid uh, for the countries of the former Yugoslavia on uh, their uh, uh, their cooperation with the court, and other countries did the same, particularly with profound effect, the European Union that said that before countries could join, uh, the, uh, uh, even the stability pact, the anteroom to the accession process of the ICCT uh, or the uh, European Union, they had to fully and completely cooperate with the court. We'd like to see the same sort of attitude when it comes to the ICC, because the thing that frustrates us the most as we look at a court that has six people that has been successfully arrested, but there are at least nine that are on the lam, another four that are uh, being held by other countries and, and, and may eventually uh, uh, proceed in, in cases that are approved by the ICC, but still only a third of, of the cases uh, have resulted in, in, in successful arrests. The message that sends is that there may be no consequences, that the hope, the expectation that we, you know, spent all our effort to build through these institutions could be diminished by a failure of this court uh, to bring its people in. Uh, and so for that reason, we've been very vocal uh, and, and have made it part of our policy that countries need to cooperate and, and to fulfill their legal obligations uh, to the court, uh, making it plain even when, when, when President Bashir uh, came to, to Kenya, to the, to, the home, to the home country of the president's father, on one of the greatest days in Kenyan history, the, the promulgation of their second, uh, their second constitution in August of 2011, a day upon which we wanted so much to congratulate the people of Kenya for the ways in which they had developed a, a, more, a stronger constitution that would allow the aspirations of, of democracy and, and, and the rule of law to be fulfilled in that country, nonetheless allowing Bashir to come, let us to say, to express you know, our disappointment uh, at their failure to observe their own obligation uh, to comply with the ICC uh, statute. And we've continued to deliver the message in the Kenyan case. 
which by the way, if you heard this morning, the trial has now been continued to August uh, for, the, for the four leaders, a case that thus far has been able to operate without arrest warrants, but with summonses, the critical importance of, of cooperation with the ICC in that case. But, but back to the Bashir example, I mean, uh, one of the, the key um, things that uh, cited, uh, I know, by the prosecutor when she appeared before the Security Council in, in appreciation of our role is you may remember that, uh, that President Bashir had visited Malawi, which is also a state party of the ICC under the, under the administration of the former president. And we were um, attempting in a variety of ways to assist M Malawi and had entered into a Millennium uh, 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 Corporation uh, grant uh, agreement uh, where we're trying to help that country achieve Millennium goals uh, for, for development. But a key part of those compacts uh, is, you know, that they uphold their international obligations and protect human rights. And allowing Bashir into the country was not consistent with that. So that was one of the factors we cited in suspending uh, that country from that compact, and, and at least for a period of time ending that aid. After the transition to President, uh, Vice President uh, Joyce Banda, uh, and, and a reversal of that decision, and a clear announcement that if the, uh, if the um, AU summit were held in Malawi, Bashir wouldn't be welcome. Uh, that and other factors have contributed to us uh, restoring, restoring that aid. Beyond the diplomatic thing, however, you know, putting our money where our mouth is is, is is a key aspect of it. And one aspect of it, it's not just a matter of money, it's also a matter of our, of, of our own, at least in advisory capacity, uh, uh, men and women in uniform as our efforts uh, to support the Ugandan army and other regional militaries. And, 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 in, in ending the, the scourge of Joseph Kony and uh, his Lord's Resistance Army and bringing him and, uh, and the others that have been indicted uh, uh, to justice, an effort uh, that continues now in Central Africa. And then if you follow the news, you'll know that uh, Congress, uh, sometimes not enthusiastic about international uh, organizations and, and, uh, and obligations, uh, at the end of last year, indeed it didn't happen until the 1st of January, passed legislation that will now allow us to pay rewards in designated cases uh, of, of individuals that are sought by the ICC and by other hybrid and international courts. We already had a program like that for, for the ICTY and ICTR. I personally, in my office, uh, recommended and presided over the payment of 14 rewards of an average of around $400,000 to people that assisted uh, with the arrest and transfer of individuals to the Yugoslavia and Rwanda Tribunal. It'll now be possible for us to do the same thing on a designated basis uh, in, in, in the case of, of, of the ICC. And we're responding in, in, in other ways uh, to this court uh, and to its requests, remembering that, of course, our guideline is, is in kind, at least in terms of our law, in kind assistance. But if it fits that, uh, we're prepared to look at any way uh, that we can help this court succeed, uh, again, on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, a decision made by our government across our interagency process that, uh, that this case is important, uh, that uh, it, it's consistent with our, with our interests and values, and, and to date, in every one of the cases that the ICC has issued arrest warrants, we have made that finding. And we've determined that these are cases uh, where, frankly, when they came to the ICC, there was nothing, nothing, zero going on at the national level. And that these were essential to justice. And, uh, and, and we, meanwhile, support efforts uh, uh, at, for complementary processes in each of these countries uh, uh, to try others, that, uh, because the ICC can never prosecute uh, uh, more, than, more than a few. Now, I know uh, in, in the discussions that I've watched this morning and listened to, uh, you know, I, I hear criticism. I heard uh, abundant criticism when, when I was involved as an, as an international prosecutor in these uh, other courts as they, as, as they overcame their, their, uh, their growing pains and, and, and began to become more efficient uh, in this process, but one that never is uh, susceptible of great efficiencies because they involve crimes not like the bank robberies that I prosecuted in Iowa that might have been over and done with in five minutes. They involved crimes that might unfold over, over five years in which every word and act uh, really had to be interpreted in terms of political and historic context uh, 
what did he mean by cockroach? <laughs> you know, what did he mean? Well, I, I could get into discussion. Uh, there, were, there were legitimate uses of that term uh, that, that related to, uh, uh, to things that happened in the 1960s. Was that an incitement or wasn't it? Uh, uh, there were, in all of these uh, uh, cases, uh, an, an absence of the kind of documentary evidence that one had at Nuremberg that, uh, that, uh, on which you could convict the Nazis, as Jackson said, uh, on their own documents alone. Uh, the need for, for insiders who could, who themselves were, were implicated in these crimes and, and, uh, and, and patterns and events uh, that, uh, uh, that took a great effort uh, to fully explore and, and to present uh, through live witnesses who were subject to, to, to cross-examination where they could, you know, frankly easily be confused coming from societies where, where the time of day or the direction on a map uh, uh, weren't necessarily familiar concepts. Uh, and, and certainly uh, uh, in each of these institutions with, with defense teams appointed and in a few cases retained uh, that were doing uh, an energetic job of, of holding the prosecution to its, uh, to its burden. So these are going to be difficult cases, but uh, uh, one does over time develop uh, more efficient, efficient ways uh, to do them. Uh, on the other hand, obviously at the ICC, the issue has been raised. We've, have one conviction on child soldiers for 14 years, another recent uh, acquittal, uh, some important trials that are, that are coming and that, and, and that are ongoing uh, on, which, uh, uh, on which things I think are, are, are going well. But we also know the challenges that a court like this faces, uh, having attended the Assembly of State Parties and, and at least watched uh, budget debates and, and countries who themselves are in economic uh, 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 challenging straits with, with reduced budgets and, and recessions, uh, paying their contributions to the court, uh, now uh, an institution with a cost of at least $150 million a, a year, and, and not having obviously the contribution of the United States or China or other countries uh, uh, to the bottom line. And, and we've seen the pressure that goes with, uh, with that kind of, of, of budgetary restraint uh, uh, which makes it difficult for a prosecutor who may have 45 or 50 investigators and, and I think needs twice that many to say, give them to me, because those would have to come out of, of other essential elements of the court. Now, as an ex-prosecutor, I tend to be biased in this regard and, and say that if you, if you don't have the prosecutor developing and investigating uh, cases and well presenting them in court, then the whole ship runs aground. Uh, none of those other things really, really matter unless, unless that's happening. But you can find in, in every part of the court um, uh, things that, that need to be done, and uh, it'd be hard to, to, to make that argument. And of course, as an American, uh, when one engages in these discussions, uh, one, I think, necessarily needs to be careful. Uh, the response to anyone who uh, uh, who hears our words of criticism would be, well, if you'd like to change it, you can join, you can pay a quarter of the dues and, and, and come on in and, and, and work on this uh, uh, together. Uh, something that's, that's, that's not possible at, at this time in our history, but you know, we'll see how things develop in the future. And we'll continue to look for ways that, that we can contribute. But uh, you know, through this, through this our, current, uh, our current law. But I think one of the things that we can do and that we've been encouraging countries to do. And, and, and certainly the message of our, of our intervention at the assembly this year of uh, talking with other countries about the need uh, to, to step up in the area of diplomacy and, and to send the, the clear signals uh, uh, on the arrests is that, uh, that others, I think, need to, uh, uh, to go to work and look for ways that this court can be assisted uh, outside the budget. Uh, ways that others could provide uh, in-kind uh, uh, contributions, investigative teams, forensic experts, other ways uh, that could be done consistent with the Assembly of State Parties uh, uh, guidelines that could strengthen uh, the things in this court that need strengthening. Uh, in every institution, uh, we know in our lives it's not enough just to pay your dues. Of course, in this one we're not paying dues, but, but for anybody who's in an institution, uh, it's not enough. You need to, 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 to find other ways to help it to succeed. And, and that's certainly the, the message that we're uh, conveying to the court and, and a willingness on our part uh, to join with others appropriately in ways that we can, uh, we can strengthen this, this, this institution. Finally, of course, 
as, as I've indicated earlier in regard to cases at the national level, even where the ICC is involved. We have to recognize that no single court can do this job. Indeed, uh, it's hard to imagine that you'll ever have a situation where there are more than you know, 20 people being tried at a time at, at the ICC. And, and you do have situations around the world where far more individuals uh, are, are engaged in, in, in these crimes. And of course, you've got them in, in places where the court does not have a reach, where there isn't a security consul will, as in the case of Syria, with the Russian clear statement that they'll veto any referral, uh, an ability to take the ICC there. And, and other situations where, and, and obviously in Syria and elsewhere, where there's not another way for the court to have jurisdiction because the citizens or the territory of a, of a, of a state party are, aren't part of it. But I think all of this needs a, a recognition that uh, the justice doesn't begin and end at the ICC, uh, that the project that we're about uh, is, is one that's, that's broader even than that, uh, important as the statute of, of, of Rome is. And, and we see this now evidenced in the way in which when we confront situations like a Sri Lanka or a, uh, or a Syria, where there's not, uh, no possibility of, of, of ICC involvement, where we have instead, you know, resolutions of the Human Rights Council, commissions of inquiry or panels of experts that are, that are formed to, to document the atrocities, efforts to work with the victims and some of them in the diaspora and, and, and elsewhere uh, to, to, to document and to build cases and to preserve the evidence, to deal with the challenges that, uh, that Julian was talking about where when justice finally is possible, it may be very difficult to find the evidence. But really to develop uh, the, the bank upon which we can draw when the day arrives, as it most certainly will, uh, when the expectations of the victims, the, what's happened elsewhere uh, in, in, these, in these cases of international justice, will open the door for justice, we hope, at the national level, if not at the national level, at, uh, at some hybrid or maybe even ICC level. But uh, that's, that's what this, this, this project is about. Uh, it's a work in progress. And, Justice is never, is never finished, as we know, and, and this, even in its 19th year, is, is, is a young project. But it's a project on which I think if governments like our own and people around the world uh, continue the efforts and support uh, that have been delivered to date, uh, we can look forward to that day when, when indeed uh, those who commit these crimes can face the certain prospect of being held to account. Thank you very much. So, um, I, I saw that lunch was scheduled for 12.50, and I don't want to get between people and lunch, but uh, I owe you an hour, don't I? And so, if there are questions, I, I yield to any of them. Hello, good morning. Um, thank you so much for joining us here. Uh, my name is Roxanne Walton. I'm a 1L here at Emory University School of Law. And I just wanted to ask how you anticipate the United States role in, in terms of the war crimes and violence that's occurring in, Pesh, in the Peshawar region, particularly with um, the strategic um, positioning of Khalida Rashid Khan there already. Do you think that that should or could be handled? Um, I guess realistically it could be handled from the national courts there, or whether or not that you know may um, rise to the level of ICC intervention. Okay, uh, and obviously, if you're talking Peshawar, you're talking uh, Pakistan. Pakistan, yeah. Yeah, and uh, and and there, obviously, we have the challenge of of, of a ter of a country that's not in the ICC, uh, and which has uh, you know those who presumably. Uh, would uh, oppose ICC cases of uh, being brought there if, if it became a Security Council issue. Uh, but there again, uh, you know, and, and I recognize when one gets into, into various places, uh, the prospect of, of achieving a, a fair judicial process may be, may be viewed challenge, as challenging. But uh, the, you know, the expectation, the demand of civil society, if, it, if it's there for this kind of justice, if, if these issues are exposed by, by international human rights groups, if, uh, 
there's then uh, uh, pressure for, for at least uh, domestic fact-finding uh, uh, mechanisms on them, and in the absence of those uh, international ones, uh, you know, pressure can build to, to have justice. Now, you know, you may be in areas of the country where the, uh, where the central government itself doesn't have great control. And, and that's often been a challenge that the ICC has responded to in Africa, and of course it doesn't automatically solve the problem. If, a, if the central government didn't have control in, in the eastern Congo to arrest Bosco and Uganda itself, the ICC that relies through, uh, uh, through state cooperation is not going to have it either. But, but I do think that these things need to be built uh, from the grassroots up and, and the international community awaken to them. And, and, you know, efforts consensually uh, uh, with the government to, to press for justice uh, need to, to be there. And that, uh, and that to the extent that, that, that matters are hidden or that people are protected, uh, that, that international efforts can eventually help shed a light on, on, on those issues. But uh, uh, it, it doesn't happen overnight. Other questions? Thank you very much for being here. Yes. Very delighted that I was able to come to. I'm Dorothy Beasley. Yes. I worked at the ICTR for four months, and so my um, my vision what, is very narrow. I haven't had all of the courts, but I wondered if you saw common threads running through all of these, starting with the ICTY, and including Lebanon and Cambodia, all of them, insofar as the development of the international law is concerned. Well, um, there's there's no question that uh, that this is building an enormous, I mean, you know, people talk about the record uh, in some areas, uh, um, you know, people say not enough cases, they took too long, but if you, if you look at this sort of the jurisprudence that's been developed uh, in these cases, I mean, beginning with the, with the Tadic case in the, in the ICT, uh, why appeals chamber, you know, clearly establishing individual criminal responsibility uh, for, these, for these acts, and then defining ways in which, uh, uh, you know, large groups of individuals, uh, people who participate in those groups could be held responsible for those acts. Uh, there are, uh, each of these institutions is then looked to that decision uh, to build uh, uh, other, other decisions. And uh, in, in the substantive law, as, as we've defined what, what these crimes mean, what, what it means to have persecution as, as a crime against humanity, what is that? and uh, that we have uh, filled in the, the empty spaces of, of international criminal law, and, uh, and one finds that, uh, that, those, uh, that those decisions uh, end up being cited uh, in the ICC, but not just in the ICC, uh, in national prosecutions that are, that are being uh, taken in, in sometimes the affected country, uh, other times by, by third countries where where these individuals have come to live. So it is, uh, I mean, in, in, in particularly in the area of jurisprudence, something that is, that is a single project. Now, I'm in a law school, so we get into the old question of a binding precedent or a persuasive one. And, and between these courts, these, these, uh, uh, these decisions are, are persuasive. But to the extent that, that learned judges uh, uh, write these opinions and, 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 and have great advocacy in, in, in front of them, uh, these uh, almost uniformly uh, end up being followed uh, and developed and refined uh, uh, as, as time goes on by, by the other institutions. So would you say that it's kind of an unspoken acceptance? I, I remember our judges I, at, the, at, at Sierra Leone Court, I, I wouldn't have picked the term, we, we won't slavishly follow <laughs> the, the, uh, the precedents of the other courts, but we will see guidance in, in, in their decisions. And I know when I've been out, uh, um, Bangladesh is a country that I've visited three times and will visit again soon, where they're uh, going through the process of trying persons uh, that are alleged to be responsible for the mass atrocities committed there in 1971 uh, during the Liberation War. You know, I've encouraged them as well to make it plain that they'll seek uh, guidance from, from these cases when they look at words like crimes against humanity what does that mean, uh, in fact? What, what are the elements? Because it's not in their statute. They need to read into that uh, the work that's been done at the international level, and, and in some situations, uh, they've done that. Eventually, there'd be a code? Well, there is a, I mean, we have a, 
you know, sometimes a, a, a criminal code is not a, is, is not a lengthy document, just like our Constitution isn't, but, uh, but that it is, uh, uh, as I say, the, the code, I mean, between the Special Court for Sierra Leone's definitions of crimes against humanity and that of the ICC, uh, there's an absolute, except for the crime of apartheid, which they didn't have in Sierra Leone, everything reads exactly the same. And, uh, and so one finds that as these institutions are established, even, even when uh, Sharif Bazayouni was working with the Iraqi judges to establish a high tribunal for the trial of regime crimes by Saddam Hussein and others, they reached into the language of the, uh, of the codes uh, of the Yugoslavia and Rwanda tribunal and the ICC. And so, uh, as I say, there, there may not, the, the Rome statute itself is a code, but uh, uh, to a large extent it's, uh, it, it's finding itself being adopted uh, by, by other courts as, as well. Understanding that international humanitarian law uh, is an evolving concept, that new and horrible things can happen on the battlefield. Sometimes you may need changes, sometimes it may be possible to adapt what was there beforehand. So it's, it's not fixed, but it's the kind of thing that can be changed through, through judge-made uh, uh, decision-making of the kind that we're, that we're all familiar with. So thank you. Questions? You have forced to do. There's my friend Charles there. <laughs> yeah, oh, thank you. Uh, is it okay if I? Go ahead. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Stephen, uh, as always, uh, for your insights. I apologize if I put you a little bit on the spot. Ah, there we go. And of course, uh, feel free uh, to not answer the question if it is touching on a sensitive issue. Uh, but I couldn't pass up the opportunity uh, to ask you something. Uh, technical that has been bothering me for a little while, and I thought maybe you might uh, seize this opportunity to tell me what your own views are, at least even if they're just personal views. And that is this situation that we found ourselves in, uh, where the United States introduced the famous uh, unsigning letter uh, to international treaty law, a concept that we didn't know, that I don't consider my signatures on the ink, on the paper anymore. Uh, what is the formal position? Is the U.S. view that now it's, still, it's a signatory or that the unsigning has to be undone uh, by another letter to the Secretary General um, in terms of its uh, status vis-a-vis -vis the Rome Statute? Uh, again, I understand completely if you can't answer it publicly, uh, but I did want to ask the question. Uh, the second one is just very quick, and that has to do with the ratification concern, which you set out, I think, very clearly, and a lot of us would agree, that there's just no hope at the moment uh, that there will be that two-thirds. Uh, but what about other measures, like, for example, repealing the Service Mem Members Protection Act, that might be indicative of a bigger uh, and stronger U.S. position in favor of the court that would help at least in the moral standing of the U.S. to speak about this issue in the type of leadership it has shown basically from Nuremberg to now in terms of the development of international criminal justice. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, in, in regard to the, to, the, to the declaration by Under Secretary Bolton, um, you know, and I, I will refer you, and, and you might want to look at it, to the speech by um, my colleague uh, um, Harold Coe's legal advisor, who, who spoke in, at, uh, in, at Leiden University in a side event of the recent ICC ASP where uh, he discussed that issue uh, in, a, in a cleared speech and, and responded to, to questions. But uh, I think what was, what was plain from, from his responses and, 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 and the statement is that uh, that uh, was not an unsigning. People called it an unsigning. There isn't such an, a thing in the, in the Convention on Treaties and Conventions, and that it was a statement of a policy by the Bush administration in its first term uh, that the United States was prepared to operate and was giving warning, that contrary to the obligations on a signatory, that it would feel itself free to operate inconsistently with the objects and purposes of, of the ICC Treaty. And, uh, what, what Harold made it plain, and, and all of our statements have made it plain, is that the, now the United States policy is to operate consistently with the objects and purposes of the, uh, of, of the, uh, of, of the treaty, and to consider ourselves uh, what we became on December 31st, 2000, a signatory of the ICC. Now, on the question of the, uh, of, um, the other issue of, um, 
of uh, potential it, repeal of the service oh, members it, and other legislative measures that by you know I, I've just uh, gone through the the process of of, of working with uh, with our legislative affairs department and with members of Congress on this rewards legislation and I remember for several for several weeks we were uh, stymied in the Senate because the, the basic rule in the Senate is that any senator can hold a, a, a bill. By the way, we had great uh, assistance from Senator, I mean, be bipartisan, uh, Senator Isaacson of, of this state was very supportive uh, in the Republican cloakroom uh, on the effort to clear that. But it involved uh, dealing with every member who had an issue, because if a member had an issue uh, and then you were in a situation, you'd have to look to trying to get a, a filibuster broken and 60 votes and, and the sometimes the kind of partisan expectations that, the, that follow from that and the, the time it takes on the floor. So it's, it's a very challenging thing to, to change the laws of, of the United States. And uh, you know, we have found in the, in the Dodd Amendment this ability to assist the court and to consult with Congress and to explain very clearly uh, what we're doing. Uh, and Congress itself, in passing the, uh, the rewards legislation, made it clear that they viewed that rewards legislation as consistent with the American Service Members Protection Act. So at this time, we're able to, to work with, uh, uh, with this. Now, you know, I don't want to, you know, we're engaged all the time in review of legislation and in ideas and, and ways that we can uh, improve our ability to respond to these crimes. And so that, you know, that's a subject that we, we, we can look at, but it will be, it will have to be something on, on which, uh, I mean, we're not interested in, in, in a quixotic battle to go down and get a bill buried or lost. We would want to work with Congress and, and look at ways that uh, we could assure the Congress that we want to protect the legitimate American interests, but we also uh, need something in order to, uh, to support um, uh, accountability. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. My name is Simon Glinsky, and I, I have a large question, but I would at least be interested in a, in a brief, whether your perspective or, or that of your office. And I think about how do the forums and trends that you described apply to the leaders and senior bodies of the United States? And we've seen many cases where parties, some friendly, some unfriendly, uh, want to use these forums to uh, create some kind of accountability or action um, towards the United States leaders or policies. So my question is, is this a risk to be managed, and if so, how? Or is this an international accountability to be encouraged? Well, you know, understand, uh, you know, we believe very much in the principle of complementarity, and that uh, if, if we were in the ICC, uh, we would give no reason for the court to ever take a case against an American because we do it ourselves. We would genuinely investigate. And even outside the ICC, that's our commitment. Uh, that if uh, in this administration, if somebody does an act, uh, uh, Sergeant Bales goes and kills 16 uh, innocent uh, Afghans, as alleged, uh, uh, we'll, we will take that case and, 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 and we, will, we will prosecute it. And, uh, and even when there's more serious kinds of allegations, like those that, that came up uh, during the last administration, the Attorney General will appoint special counsel and, and determine, uh, you know, if there's prosecutable cases to be, uh, to be made. And, and I note that even in, in the uh, Spanish courts recently, where there were cases against, uh, or investigations that had begun potentially against Americans, uh, the, the court in, in, in affirming the end of those prosecutions had found that uh, uh, the U.S. had a system and, and was, was in a good faith way uh, looking at uh, uh, um, these acts and determining whether there was a, a prosecutable case. Uh, complementarity doesn't require that you, uh, that you uh, well, certainly doesn't require you convict people and it doesn't require even that you charge them. It requires that you look at what the facts and circumstances are and determine whether you have a case that can be successfully prosecuted. And, uh, and, and, and it's our policy uh, uh, to do that. Uh, and uh, our own system of military justice uh, is, is uh, um, you know, noted for its, you know, for being a model. You have a defense legal institute that works with militaries around the world, uh, training people on how to, how to do these cases. And, and Bill Leitzow, my colleague from the Pentagon, who was a part of our delegation in, in Rome in 98, 
actually was the, the major author of Article 8 of the ICC statute on war crimes and later of the elements of the crime because of, because of our experience. And in, in, uh, in two months, we're going to be celebrating in Washington the, the 150th anniversary of the Libra Code, uh, promulgated by President Lincoln on April 24, 1863, that established the laws of armed conflict and was then the model for the Hague Conventions. So it's, uh, it's something upon which the United States itself uh, will, uh, will, 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 will handle. Uh, this business of the U.S. and our difficulty in, in passing uh, treaties, um, I just, this may seem like a digression, but, it's, but I think it's an important point. Uh, I remember one time I was uh, in Geneva visiting with, with uh, Navi Pile, South African uh, jurist who had been president of the ICTR, had presided over the media trial that I, that I, uh, that I uh, led, later was an ICC judge for six years and is now the High Commissioner for Human Rights in, in, in Geneva. And I was mentioning you know, that we had this difficulty of passing conventions uh, in the U.S. and there was the Convention on the Rights of the Child where it had even been noted by our Supreme Court that only, there were only two countries in the world that hadn't ratified it and they were the United States and Somalia. And I just received word that the Transitional Federal Assembly of Somalia, meeting in Nairobi, had ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and now we were alone. And I was, to some extent, bemoaning this uh, about our system, and, and she then said, uh, threw me a, a life preserver, said, but, but you protect the rights of the child so much better than most of the countries that have ratified the treaty. And so I think we do have to recognize that in our own institutions, in our own traditions, in our own respect for rights, uh, we have been able to, to, to deal with this, and that is, I think, part of the reason why Americans are often reluctant uh, to jump into, in, into in, uh, to the international level, though many of us think there, there can be values uh, if it's clearly understood what you're doing and, and, uh, and, and, and you go in. But uh, that's, that's, that's part of our challenge. But, uh, but I think the, the main message I think that we want to send is uh, whether we're inside or outside these treaties or conventions, we will uh, conduct ourselves in accordance with uh, the laws of humankind. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. Anything else? Well, thank you. Enjoyed it, and we'll, let's get to lunch. <laughs> bye bye. Okay. Let me again uh, just briefly uh, thank, of course, Ambassador Rapp for his remarks, thank the Biederman family for being here, and thank all the supporters of the Biederman Lecture for helping to make this wonderful occasion uh, uh, today and in the future possible. I know if David was here, he would have enjoyed the lecture, uh, as Ambassador Rapp described to us, the sometimes messy ways in which we are all moving towards this goal of justice, including the United States, in the ways that it's able, um, as, uh, as an aficionado of custom, uh, as, a, as a form of law, I know David really would have appreciated it. And so please, again, join me in thanking Ambassador Rapp and, again, all the supporters of the lecture.